Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I've got a really interesting gentleman to introduce you tonight. His name is John Rapley. He is the Managing Director of Seafood Macro. Uh, he is a political economist at it's the University of Cambridge, sir, is that uh, you're at? That's correct. And uh, he's written a, a, a numerous different articles, but one that I read most recently that was really quite interesting, an opinion piece that said, the year ahead for 2023, good for workers, bad and ugly for investors. John Rapley, welcome to my show, sir. Well, it's good to be here with you, Brian. Thank you. And so you're uh, calling into us from uh, London? I'm in Cambridge. In Cambridge. And, in Cambridge uh, in England, yep. So it's evening, uh, late evening your time, so I appreciate you It's joining evening, so it's gray, it's, it's, yeah, it's a bit gloomy, but uh, this is England in the winter. So tell me, why is 2023 going to be bad for investors? We'll come back to where, why it's going to be good for workers in a minute, but why is it going to be bad for investors in your opinion? <laughs> Principally because a couple of things are happening. Um, profits reached a peak last summer, and since then they've been declining, and there's reason to believe that will be a long-term decline. So we're expecting, um, at Seaford Macro, we're expecting there to be continued margin compression. Um, and in addition to which, I think inflation, although inflation is has been coming down and will continue coming down, it's not going to get back down. You know, I've written earlier an earlier piece I did for the Globe Mail on inflation itself. I just don't envision us getting back to 2% inflation in the coming year or anytime soon for that matter. I think we're going to settle at a higher rate for the foreseeable future. That means interest rates still have room to rise. Uh, that in turn is going to depress multiples on both, well, all asset values. And I think that markets simply haven't priced this in yet. And so I think we're going to look for, I think you know the, the year's got off to a fairly good start. Um, liquidity has gone up as a result, and this is not conditions that most central banks are going to be entirely happy with, certainly not the Fed. And I think as a result of that, what you're going to see is that, uh, you know, the rallies we have seen may continue for a little while, but certainly by later in the year, I think you're going to see a bear market resuming, and I think that'll be for all asset classes. And of course, property in Canada is particularly vulnerable. I've written, also written separately about that in the Global Mail. Uh, this is the period right now we'll find out just uh, if it's going to get bad or if it's going to get ugly. Ugly would be if, in fact, the very high volume we saw of short-term debt issuance, so variable mortgage, variable rate mortgages that were issued this time last year as they start coming due, if those were people who business models, you know, they were looking to flip those properties and make some capital gains, and now they, you know, they now stand to lose and they've been holding off selling but they have forced to go to market because they simply can't afford the higher rates of interest. That could cause a much sharper downward adjustment in house prices in Canada at any rate. Sharper so adjustment has already been uh, already occurred. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, I think the general view would probably be the general prediction. And bear in mind that my predictions are not the mainstream opinion. I mean, these are very much, um, and some would say they're outright counterintuitive, but we're fairly confident based on our research. Um, and the general view would be, well, we're going to see a continuous softening of house prices, maybe a leveling off, no real growth. Um, I wouldn't be, that is possible, but it's also possible it could get much worse. So I was watching uh, CNN this morning, probably not the best uh, uh, source of uh, information, but I, I was surprised that they showed uh, inflation graphs for many different commodities and uh, and actually were down, other than oil, were down lower than uh, the prices were in January of 2022 20, uh, prior to the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so mm -hmm. they were suggesting that actually inflation is, uh, is sort of worked through or, or commodities have at least worked through the 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 war impact and uh, and we're back down to a reasonable level of inflation. What what what's your response to that, sir? Well, there's two answers. One would be the you know the soft case. One would be the hard case. The soft case would be well, let us take that to be true. I don't think we're going to see continued falls in commodity prices. I think that has run its course. So we'll see a leveling off. And we've had some very sharp disinflation in recent much months. That was always to be expected. There was there are two components to the inflation surge. One is the uh, the underlying deep drivers, which have to do with labor costs and poor productivity, and then also very, I would say, excess rent. So you have you know very, very high profits, uh, very strong wealth effect caused by rising asset values in Canada, particularly housing, and that has driven a lot of consumption, and that has continued to keep inflation up. 
Um, but the transitory elements were those, you know, all to do with supply chain effects brought on by the pandemic. Those were going to run their course and we're also getting base effects kicking in. And so the last three or four months, if you look at the inflation reports, I mean, you would, you could easily say, well, we're already at 2% inflation. If you take this, it's a string of most recent reports. The problem is that those base effects will have run their course. That's the soft case. So we're not going to see any softening. Um, you know, and so the, if you extrapolate from recent trends and say inflation will continue down at that rate, then yes, you have the rosy scenario. But I think what you're going to find is uh, core inflation has been declining more slowly than headline inflation. You're going to see a convergence at a higher level. I'm, I'm guessing in the 3 to 4% range. And as that happens, interest rates are going to be revealed to be still too low. So that would be the one thing. The hard case, of course, is a different one, which is that for the very loose liquidity conditions that are starting to, or not very loose, but the loose uh, liquidity conditions that have begun to reemerge in markets are going to run contrary to the intentions of central banks. And the reopening of China is going to cause a boost and you're going to see some return. And we are starting to see this in some minerals that there is some rise in commodity prices. So I think counting on that, that sort of scenario, and I think probably in this case, it is a case of you know, perhaps CNN not being the cutting edge on this. I think you're going to it would be a rather, rather Pollyannish, I would put it, to say to assume that that is going to continue that sort of scenario we've seen in recent months. We've had a good few months, and we're going to continue to see falling inflation, and that's why I say I think for workers it's going to get good because I think inflation will actually fall below, continue falling, whereas I think wage gains may well hold more strongly, and we're going to see the emergence of possible real wages later in the year, real positive real wages. McLean's Magazine had a year-end report, and they were saying that this is going to be the year of unionization, uh, which is a little bit ironic. Well, it may well be. We are certainly seeing more. Um, and I, when I say more labor militancy, we'd only be we're, – we're so far from historic norms because labor militancy has been highly depressed by – uh, you know, the very sharp drop in unionization, the change in legislation in many countries that makes it harder to organize strikes. But we are seeing growing power in organized labor. The other thing what we're finding is that in labor markets, very often you don't need a large scale unionization before it really begins to have knock on effects. I mean, the big employers, for example, are keeping a very close eye on what's happening in wage negotiations elsewhere. And when they see effective unionization, they're sometimes taking preemptive measures by raising wages in the hopes that they can sort of head off unionization. So we're seeing simply the tightening conditions in the markets driving wage gains. If you look here in the UK, for example, something very interesting has happened. Uh, the, the unions today are now mainly concentrated in the public sector, and there has been a growing wave of militancy. But if you look at the wage situation, uh, the earnings in the public sector, they're badly depressed. They're very negative in, in real terms, and they're far behind private sector gains. But in the private sector, which has very low incidence of unionization, wages have been rising quite strongly. And in some subsectors are now, you know, real wages are positive, in spite of the fact that Britain has pretty horrendous inflation uh, and a very bad, you know, mis mismanagement to the economy. So even without unions, we're seeing this rising bargaining power of labor. And where there's an attempt to fight back against that, it becomes almost inevitable, I think, in those situations, and we're already seeing that you're seeing uh, union organizing beginning. And the other interesting thing, at least in the United States, is that this is a much more organic process. This is not top down. This is not unions, the big established unions stepping in and organizing workers. It's workers in the workplace who are getting together and forming their own unions, which are turning out to be very effective in some ways because they're much closer to the ground. They know the tactics that would work, and they're also engaged with the people on the ground so they can mobilize them more effectively. It, it, it's a little bit strange that we have uh, you know, this uh, potential of recession with such low unemployment. Um, you know, certainly in Canada, the United States, I'm not sure what it is in uh, in the UK. Um, how does that play into your uh, prognosis? So as far as the UK goes, just quickly get that one out of the way. I mean, I think the UK is effectively already in recession. We'll probably be in recession through the year. Uh, the, the United Kingdom is, is very sickly. It's the poor man of Europe, as it's called now. It's uh, It's just been one... Uh, mistake after another over the last seven years. Uh, very, very well. There was Brexit, and then the the deal they ultimately negotiated the Europeans was awful. 
um, it, and, and they won't, you know, the country is the political class and is in a state of denial. So they're not dealing with the fundamental problems. So that there's no particularly rosy scenario for Britain. I mean, uh, they're suffering worse inflation effects and worse growth effects as a result of all this. But in the European Union, in the United States, and I think in Canada, what you're going to find is at most, I think we're going to see short shallow recessions. It's not going to be anything significant. You could say already we've started to see a beginning of recession, it, like there's been a profit recession. Um, earnings, interestingly, uh, wages at the top end of the income scale have been coming down much more sharply than at the low end where they've been rising. We've kind of seen a reversal of the last 30 years where it's better to be an unskilled laborer than a highly skilled laborer, which was not the case for the last 30 years. So, and some of that is what is driving the disinflation is that some people are already feeling like they're in recession. But in the aggregate, I think that wage gains will probably remain strong enough to provide a floor on demand that'll keep the economy from sinking into too deep or too long a recession may even, I think the US may even avoid a recession altogether. And for many people, many working people at any rate, it won't feel like a much of a recession at all of it by the end of the year. I think on the other hand, you can already say if you're somebody who's living off the um, dividends or you're living off the value of your property, it, it could feel like a rough year. And that will definitely show up in the consumption at that end. Because the property values are going to decline in your assessment. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I, not just in Canada, but Canada may, you know, has a particularly acute case. We're chatting tonight with uh, John Rapley. He's a political economist at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he's a managing director of a, uh, is it a hedge fund uh, or? A... No, it's a research firm. A research uh, firm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, an uh, incredibly uh, well-educated uh, gentleman. I'm going to go through. It's called Seafood uh, Macro. The Seaford. The Seaford. Yeah. Seaford uh, Macro. The uh, the research firm that you're associated with. Um, we're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes with uh, Dr. John Rapley. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're talking tonight about uh, the economy in 2023. My guest is John Rapley. Um, he's got a really unbelievably interesting uh, background. Uh, he's got a BA in political science and history from Carleton University, then uh, a master's and a PhD in political economy from Queen's University. And then he went over uh, across the ocean to the University of Oxford, uh, got a postdoctoral fellowship in political economy. Uh, you've worked really in, in Germany and in Johannesburg and in, uh, in Cambridge, uh, uh, you know, all over the place. Tell me if you could just take a step back and tell me about your career and, and, and why you came from uh, from Canada to uh, to Johannesburg and, and ended up in the UK. Well, I guess the UK thing was just uh, partly it was personal. You know, my I come from a family of British immigrants. I was born and raised in Canada, but we always had this connection, always had a hankering to go back when I had that opportunity to do to start my academic career. With a postdoc in Oxford, I, I sort of took the opportunity. I was working in the field of uh, the political economy of development. And while I was in Oxford, after a while, I got a commission to write a textbook in development studies. And I, I was sort of feeling a bit, um, a bit dissatisfied with field trips. I felt I wasn't really doing more than scratch the surface. I felt I needed to immerse myself in the topic. So that's when I really began my long venture living and working in developing countries, took a Took a lectureship at a university in Jamaica and spent, in the end, spent 17 years there because I also then worked in journalism. I set up a think tank, uh, at the end of which I came back to England, settled into Cambridge, uh, began the writing life. And, you know, I did these visiting professorships and do these visiting professorships. And that's what takes me around and about. I guess you could say I'm one of those people who doesn't know what he wants to be when he grows up. So he keeps trying his hand at different things. Fascinating. And, and you've written... Um you know, unbelievably interesting articles on prime ministers and billionaires and private islands and drug lords and victims of sex slavery. What's yeah. with all that? Well, that's my part of my journalism. But I'll tell you, the interesting segue into crime was something that happened that began in the late 1990s. I was writing about, you know, then current is a new, fairly new topic still was globalization. And I was really interested, you know, using a fairly conventional model, the impact of globalization on states and developing countries in the global periphery. Uh, the idea being that their capacity was being eroded and you had increasing lawlessness in 1994 or 95. It was Robert Kaplan published a much, much uh, read essay called The Coming Anarchy, where he predicted basically a wave of state collapse. And this was the time when political scientists were talking about state failure. 
And um, I thought, well, look, so I'm, I'm sitting at the, the coal face here. Um, I, I see state failure in the inner city. I was living in Kingston at the time in Jamaica. Um, you know, whole sections of the inner city controlled by drug gangs. And I had to get to know what it was like and what was going on. So I decided to study the drug trade. Um, and that took me into another world. And it, it was a totally different world because one of the first revelations I had when studying transnational crime is when you go into communities that were controlled and they did seem to be beyond their control of the state. The police didn't want to go into these communities because it wasn't safe for the police to go in. So you just assumed it was the Wild West and lawless. But in fact, these were some of the most orderly and well-run communities in Jamaica. They were under the iron grip of a drug gang, uh, which ran it uh, with an iron fist, but had a, an interest in maintaining stability. But moreover, the, it wasn't quite state failure. They had a rather complicated relationship with the government, you know, and it existed in a certain symbiosis. So I came with this idea, this conception that, well, we're, you know, we're entering a new, new medievalism, essentially. I wrote about the New Middle Ages, an article on foreign affairs. And that gave on to a project, which a book, actually, which is coming out this May with a co-author of mine who actually wrote a book on the fall of the Roman Empire. And I said, well, are we looking at something similar? So that's coming out in May, a book that's called Why Empires Fall, which will be published by Penguin. So and that's ultimately how I ended up in South Africa, because at that time, the South African, you know, my, my colleagues at an institute there took an interest in this. And they said, oh, we seem to have the same phenomenon in South Africa. Could you come and write about this? And so I spent some time there and ever fell in love with South Africa. It's, you know, it, it has its problems, but it's a wonderful place. And so I took a recently took an, an invitation to become a senior fellow at an institute there as well. And that's my Johannesburg connection. What a fascinating career. I'd love to chat with you at some point in time about uh, development, uh, economics and politics. I think that's uh, an interesting, uh, a very interesting topic. Let's come back to uh, the, the topic of 2023, though, if you could. Uh, you made a comment that you thought uh, core inflation and headline inflation would be different in the way it acts. Can you explain to everyone the difference between core inflation and headline inflation and the point you're making? Well, there are various measures of, you know, inflation, you know, how do you measure it? There's all sorts of different measures we use, but the standard one we use is uh, usually when there's an article about inflation, we look at consumer price inflation or producer price inflation. But if you say consumer price inflation, um, that would include, you know, a wide basket of items, but some of those are particularly volatile, in particular food and energy, they're highly cyclical. Uh, they can rise up and down very sharply in the space of, you know, days, let alone months. And so generally the measures of core inflation will strip out usually food and energy. And then you have other measures, so-called trim means that central banks will use to try and get a true picture of what's happening in inflation. Because of course, uh, one of the other problems is as prices change, our the composition of our basket, you know, we, we buy substitutes. We avoid inflation by buying different products, eating a slightly different diet. And so capturing all this is difficult. So we try to come up with a measure of core inflation, which is, well, you know, we say we strip out those really volatile things. What are we left with? You know, this month, gas prices might go up. Next month, they might go down. That changes the inflation picture. But if you take that out, what are we left with? And you can look at the broader trend. And that's where we get the so-called core inflation, uh, you know, which is therefore it, it's less volatile and the true trend, if you will, the true underlying trend is what emerges. And the argument we have made in our research at Seaford Macro in an earlier paper on this very topic of inflation is that one of the underappreciated aspects of the era of low inflation we got used to over the last 30, 30, 40 years, but really 30 years, is the very low cost of labor relative to Profits. I mean, the share of the wage share in GDP in most G7 economies has gone down somewhat or leveled off, whereas profits have gone up as a share of GDP. And what that reflected was the relatively weak bargaining power of particularly of unskilled labor due to the massive opening of labor reserves in the global periphery the biggest migration in human history from the countryside and developing in post-colonial societies, developing societies into the major cities, which were themselves increasingly integrated into the global economy. And so that meant that Western firms didn't even need to outsource their production to lower wage zones. They could simply threaten to outsource the production. They gained a great deal of leverage. They could weaken a union's uh, role in you know, the workplace. These various measures put in place but what we found, and you know, we're not the only ones saying this, of course, this has been known for some time, that the, first of all, the growth of global labor supply has peaked, population growth is slowing across the planet and everywhere but Africa, and Africa 
presents a problem in that there's a very large labor force, surplus labor force, but access is to the world economy is difficult because of infrastructure and political challenges. So the global labor supply is actually starting to grow more slowly. And you combine that in Western countries with aging populations. And we have this situation where labor will continue the underlying trends in the labor market are going to be continue to give that power to workers. This hasn't been factored into most of the economic projections made. I had a long interview this week with a journalist at the Financial Times who wrote an article on this about the the um, what he called the uh, the forever labor, uh, what was it, the forever labor shortage, I think he called it. This idea that this was an extraordinary period, which we took to be normal. This was just, you know, we extrapolated future trends from what happened over these past 30 years, but that in historical context, those 30 years were not only unprecedented, but will never recur. And we're moving back into, you know, closer to historical norms. And so there's going to be a lot of catch up. So a lot of that, as I say, labor militancy isn't suddenly workers becoming aggressive and assertive. It's simply returning to some of the traditional assertiveness that would have been there. And um, this kind of uh, expectation hasn't been factored in sufficiently by central banks, uh, you know, by, by corporations, by governments. And it's going to, that will be the new normal. So this is interesting. So you're, what you're effectively saying is that in China, this huge movement from rural China to, to urban China that then uh, rejoined uh, the global economy really kept labor prices down around the world. And you don't think that's going to happen again in India or or what? India has already uh, um, in, enjoyed that, uh, that change and it's not going to happen in Africa. I was in Nigeria a few years ago, uh, Lagos, and um, you know the population growth, the urbanization there looks like it's going to be exactly what happened in China, but you're saying it's not going to have the same impact. The difficulty is I mean, there's a couple of problems with uh, the growth of urban labor markets because it's not just a matter of having the people. You have to have the infrastructure, which makes it possible to successfully outsource. You have to have the political stability, which makes it you know desirable for firms to set up there. And there are a number of features which conspire. That doesn't mean there's not a lot of outsourcing happening, but it, it does reduce or sorry it increases the marginal cost and so the people who are willing to outsource production usually already have some kind of presence there it's not at the moment a particularly attractive destination a city like lagos for someone saying well you know i'm manufacturing something in brampton let me do it cheaper in lagos it, it, there's still quite an obstacle that's not to say it won't change i mean it may change and that could be a game changer for the world economy but at the moment you can't really point to many African countries where you could say there are significant developments in that direction. In fact, if anything, the trends are going slightly in the contrary direction that you get in, in many sub-Saharan African countries, you're getting increasing political uncertainty due to the spread, for example, of uh, ISIS, in, you know, once it was ejected from Syria and Iraq, it sort of began setting up branch operations in many African countries. And so some of the countries which are, are integrating more deeply into the world economy are the very same ones that are facing these kind of threats, which is keeping investment uh, at bay. And even in South Africa, which would be the biggest and one would you know, one would expect the most stable economy, even South Africa is having major difficulties with infrastructure at the moment, for example, it's energy grid is is collapsing. So why is I South Africa's energy grid collapsing? Well, that's a long story, which has to do with post apartheid politics in South Africa. But the long and short of it is that the country's major utility, which is called the ESCOM, uh, simply has not uh, maintained a level of investment sufficient to increase its capacity. And it is trying to bring about a shift to away from coal-based, carbon-based energy to renewable energy. Af South Africa has massive resources of renewable energy available, both wind and solar. Uh, that is encountering various political obstacles from vested interests. And so it's an extraordinarily fraught position. So the result is that the, uh, and of course, you've had a massive expansion of distribution and apartheid electricity was produced primarily for a fifth of the population, you know, mostly it was, you know, and that was the nature of apartheid, it was sort of delivering first world standards to a minority of the population, based essentially on their skin, skin color. Once you end apartheid, and you now bring all the country into distribution networks, including electrification. So there's been a huge expansion 
in connectivity, you know, people being connected to the grid, but not enough expansion in the grid capacity and in the generating capacity to keep up. And now the whole thing is collapsing. Fascinating. Um, you know, there was an article in this McLean's Magazine year-end uh, uh, issue that I mentioned that talked about uh, immigration in Canada and uh, how the population uh, was declining, that the uh, amount of people in the workforce was declining, and that immigration was the only solution to uh, create a, a economy that could actually support all the uh, elderly people that were going to be demanding health care, senior care, etc. Sounds to me like what what workers should be doing is opposing that immigration because what you're arguing is that that's actually good for workers. Um, it, it depends. It's hard to say. I don't think in, in a case like Canada, um, I mean, we do see some inflationary impacts as a result of anti-immigrant policies. Uh, for example, in Britain, you know, there's been a, a sharp reduction in, in immigration, particularly from Eastern Europe as a result of the Brexit vote. And that has had beneficial effects at the low end of the income scale. The problem is it's bad for the economy. And therefore, it might be in the short run good for wages, but in the longer run, it isn't. I think anyhow, what you're going to find, Brian, is over the longer term is that, I mean, an economy like Canada is absolutely depends on immigration, because if it doesn't have immigration, it actually has a contracting labor supply. It has a contracting population. Because if you take immigration out of the picture in Canada, you have a declining population, because of course, many Canadians you know, don't pay attention to this, but it's, you know, it's a simple fact that everyone knows. A lot of Canadians leave Canada, especially as they get close to retirement. They don't particularly want to stay in this cold, great white north. They love to romanticize it. But the truth is they'd much rather be in Florida or the Caribbean when they're retired. So population tends to decline. And of course, a lot more Canadians go to find jobs in America than Americans who come to find jobs in Canada. So that's a, another magnet. So we need immigration in Canada in order to be able to to keep the economy functioning. But having said that, I think what you're going to find is that over time, the for immigrants, because people have this can sometimes have a very simplistic attitude to immigration is, well, of course, they'd come here, you know, they make more money, the opportunities are better, it's a no brain or any anybody with a brain will come. Well, if that's the case, why is it that of that massive migration, as I said, in, you know, the, the, the last four decades, some 2 billion people who have moved into, you know, left their homes to go find greener pastures, but only less than 5% of them have actually left their homeland. Most of them are staying close to home. It's because emigration is tough. It's a big adjustment. You have to abandon your family. You have to abandon your friends. You have to abandon. And bear in mind that, you know, I am born a sort of British citizen in Canada. So I have two passports. I can come and go freely to Canada. I'm not in a situation like many immigrants who migrate to Canada and then can't go back to their homeland until they're fully you know, naturalized or they have landed immigrant status. So you're really cut off from everything you know. And that's why very few people want to make the move. Now, the other thing is when you factor in that in developing countries, because A, wages are rising there for the very same reasons I'm saying, but also you add in the fact that those countries on average, and in some cases much more, are growing much more rapidly than Western societies, wages will rise more quickly. There will be more and more convergence with the wage levels we're used to in Western countries. The result of all that is that at the margins each year, I would suggest and this will play out over decades, there will be fewer people wanting to leave their homelands. And the only way to get around that is you're going to have to make immigration more attractive. Countries are going to act, actually have to start, to start stop treating immigrants as being opportunists coming to sort of get rich off our country and are going to have to look at them as a resource and have to go out of their way the same way firms try and recruit really bright workers with, with bonuses. You know, Visa processes will have to be streamlined, made easier. The cost will have to come down. These are the kind of measures that will need to be taken because the simple fact, Brian, is that the aging of the population means that the dependency ratio is rising. If you reduce the supply of immigrants, yes, your wages may go up at the margins in certain categories, particularly in unskilled labor, may go up higher, but so will your taxes because you're going to be supporting an elderly population which has grown accustomed to these lifestyles that's another topic I've written about for the Globe and Mail. We have to probably face up to the fact that sooner or later, these pension systems will become unsustainable.
And uh, you've just seen recently all the uh, objections in France to trying to increase the pension uh, age. So I think that's not an easy transition. It We're trying to stay with uh, John Rapley uh, about the economy in 2023. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour we're on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Dr. John Rapley. He is the managing director of C. Ford Macro uh, in, uh, in uh, the UK. He's also a political economist at the University of Cambridge. He's got uh, uh, quite an educational background, uh, both in Canada as well as uh, internationally. And, and he writes quite frequently for the Globe and Mail and books. And, and uh, uh, it, it says that you've got one of the highest uh, Google um Google citations on Google Scholar, over 2,000 citations. So that's a pretty uh, impressive, sir, and I appreciate you joining us. Uh, we're talking about the economy in 2023. Uh, you think that it's going to be good for employees, good for workers, but bad for for a profit, for companies, for the stock market. Um, one of the things that you had said earlier in the show was that you thought that there was too much liquidity in the marketplace and that that was a challenge to central bankers. I thought that central bankers had... Uh, had stopped QE2 and all the other things that were going on to add liquidity into the uh, into the into the market. So why is there still liquidity? Why is there still high liquidity? Well, there's a massive amount of liquidity. If you just look at the, I mean, if you just look at the curves of the the money that central banks have put into the markets, most of it is still there. It hasn't been circulating freely over the last couple of months because of the tightening policies that have been begun by central banks. But because this perception has now emerged that it's over and soon there's going to be even, you know, we hear talk of a pivot that soon interest rates will come back down. So the private holders of liquidity are starting to move it around again. So it's starting to be, you know, rather than holding on to their cash, they're starting to put it into work. They're buying shares, they're buying bonds, they're buying most everything. And so that money is coming back into the markets. That's what accounts for the rise in liquidity is central banks are still tightening and I expect they will continue tightening. So I think the expectation, the fact is, Brian, is that markets had become rather drunk on endless stimulus. And there was an expectation we could just count on this. I mean, the central banks have our back. And one of the things I've always argued that when you have an independent central bank, if there's one thing, it's sine qua non, it's raison d'etre, it's the one thing it will never give up is the value of the currency. Now, they define inflation in ways that you could say are beneficial to asset owners and harm workers. Namely, they focus on consumer price inflation. They pay no attention to asset price inflation on the grounds that it's not the real economy. Only when it enters the real economy does it become consumer price inflation. But my argument is that what Asset price inflation, particularly the housing, and I would call it a bubble, even though many of my colleagues said it's not a bubble. I'm sure it's a bubble in Canada. What that has done is created um, a, a wealth effect, among other things. But it also, and this is an important thing. I mean, it's important to appreciate the role that property prices play on the cost of everything else through the channel of labor costs. And I'll give you a simple illustration of this. I can hire for my company, for example, we could hire a very bright young economist in Joburg, Johannesburg and pay them one sixth, one eighth of what we would pay the similar economist in London. Is it because it's a poor country and you can exploit poor workers? No, it isn't because that economist will actually live a better life in Johannesburg than the one in London paid the much higher rate. Why is the economist in London so expensive? Because you need to pay in a young economist that much for them to be able to live, given the cost of real estate, given the cost of rent. I mean, it's extortionate. And it's the same now in some of the, you know, in, in a city like Toronto. And that doesn't get factored in. But the result is that what you had is you had pent up, you know, the costs, as it were, were being passed onto the shoulders of workers for years and rent increases. And even though we kept hearing, oh, you know, we don't have inflation, it, it must have sounded pretty galling to a worker whose rent was going up every year by X percent. And we're told, well, you know, that's not inflation is stable. Now that, as I say, for various reasons, workers at the moment, and I think this will be permanent, have more power to bargain for better wages, there's going to be some catch up and there'll have to be some convergence. There's going to have to be a fall in some of those asset prices and a rise in wages until you get some convergence. Um, <clears throat> so that that kind of, you know, it's a bit of a digression, but I think it's important to keep coming back to this. We've only just begun this tightening cycle. 
and a lot of liquidity still has to, a lot of money has to come out of the market and it's not going to come out. The expectation among mainstream economists, you know, Larry Summer has been going on and on and on. How do you bring that? And the governor of the Bank of Canada said the same thing. We need workers to stop getting these pay increases for inflation to come down and we may even need a bit of unemployment. And yet we're seeing fairly robust job markets, even though asset prices are falling. And I think that's where the disinflation will continue to come from. It's going to be at the top end, not among workers, not to the same extent. So let's talk about housing prices in uh, in Canada. I saw a graph recently that showed that uh, that house prices to incomes and house prices to rents in uh, Canada today are sort of at the same level uh, that the United States was prior to the crash in, in 20, uh, 2008, 2009. Uh, and, and if you compared it to the United States, the United States had this big decline there uh, and then increased thereafter. Canada has just gone on uh, ever since. Um, I think that, you know, you talk about Toronto, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, house prices are outrageous. And, and, and while volumes have come down, it doesn't appear that most of the realtors think that house prices have actually come down that much. And, and where they have come down, it would be in the, in the suburban locations that had this huge increases because of people moving out of city centers during COVID. So what's your assessment of what's going to happen or what should happen to house prices in Canada? Well, on this one, Brian, I'm simply not the expert. I mean, I, I, I'm not a realtor and I'm not a, you know, I, I'm not an economist whose primary job is studying the Canadian economy. So I can only go on the basis of what I know. What I can say is I put it in international context. And Canadian real estate is off the charts. You know, you mentioned, you know, the parallels to the US before the crash in 2008, but it's actually much worse than it was in 2008 in the US. If you look at the household debt to GDP, if you look at the household income to property values, all those ratios, Canada's in well into the red zone. You know, the alarm bells should have been ringing a long time ago. And I think on this one, the Bank of Canada has a great deal to answer for. Uh, it is possible that, you know, they're going to stabilize. I mean, that would be one way this plays out, that house prices stabilize and then incomes go over time, catch up, and you get some convergence happening that way. That is possible. Um, but it is also possible that it will play out much more quickly and that you'll see some sharp falls in values. Now, the thing about, you know, this is something that's not a popular opinion, <laughs> But I'm going to come out and say it. I don't know who ever got the idea that it would be a clever thing to market a home as an investment because homes should not be thought of as investments. And when homes become investment, it's usually a sign of an unhealthy economy. Homes are for living in and they should be for living in. They should be in that sense thought of as consumption items, not investment items. They make sense for the many people and possibly most people. You know, they'll say my home was a best investment I ever made. That is because effectively, most people are not as good at saving as they would like to be. And so they need, as it were, someone to, you know, hold a whip hand over them to every month, say, you know, put your money in saving. And that's what a mortgage does. It forces you to put the money into equity. But if you actually look at the value long term of property investment, house investment, they only make sense as an asset to a specific class, a rather small class of investors. And it would be essentially those with very long time horizons who are looking for a steady dividend. It doesn't have to be a large dividend. So the classic example would be pension funds. But the idea that on top of that, you would make money off capital gains is actually a, is a sign, as I say, of a disease in an economy because you're leading that that's an indicator of capital misallocation. And this is part of the problem that you have in Canada. Labor productivity is very poor in Canada because it doesn't really make sense to invest in raising the output of your workers when you can make more money simply buying a scarce asset and watching it rise in value, partly because planning regulations, politics, you know, fiscal policies, and particularly monetary policies are more or less underwriting that value for you. So I think it's a sign of a real, um, a real problem in the Canadian economy that has to be rectified. And that, if it's to be rectified, will be painful. Now, politically, nobody wants to take a decision like that. Who wants to get elected saying, I'll ensure your property comes down by 30%? Because the other problem you run up against there is the political calculus that property owners are more likely to vote than renters. 
yes, bringing down house prices would be good for all those renters, but they're less likely to vote at the margins. And so they don't tip elections the same way. So politicians are always in the business of coming up with new ways to keep, you know, they say we'll solve the housing crisis without bringing down house prices. Well, you know, th those are, you, do you do one or the other, you know, you're going to have to make your mind up. Yeah. And, and I was on a, a radio show, a talk show, a CBC show last year. And I, I, I sort of, I think, threw the cat among the pigeons and upset a lot of people when they kept talking about the housing crisis. I said, there isn't a housing crisis as far as most Canadians are concerned. This is actually a great situation. If you're a homeowner and you've seen the value of your asset go up or you the rent that your tenants have to pay is going up, what crisis? You know, we talk a lot about it, but we don't actually want to solve it. And I think it needs solving. That would be my contention. But as you point out, there's a heck of a lot of people that have got a lot of net worth uh, built up in that house and don't necessarily want to see house prices go down. It's going to harm their their retirement. It it could harm their retirement if that and that was and that's my my point, Brian, is that people should never have been encouraged to think of their homes as their retirement. That was a cop out by governments, which should have been you know providing better pension options and seeing that better pension options were available to them. But one of the things about inflating property values is it, it is a short-term way to solve a long-term problem that I mentioned earlier. The, it's not just that the share of the population, which is retired, is going up and will continue going up year after year. It's that they're living longer and longer. And that is imposing more and more. We're seeing this in healthcare systems in many Western countries, Canada included, that's imposing great burdens on the healthcare system, which is going to force some very difficult choices. And I think one difficult choice that will have to be faced is the one that France is trying to face, which is raising the pension age. But the other one is we may ultimately have to revisit the whole idea of what retirement means. The expectation of many people is that you work you know, half your life and you spend the rest of your life you know, enjoying it, uh, collecting a pension. And that's actually not a sustainable model unless you have some kind of subsidy coming in. And we have in Canada, I would argue, over the last generation, the subsidy has come from working people. Their earnings have been depressed in order to inflate asset values. And that has made it possible to keep the pension fund solvent. But I don't think that's going to be able to continue for the simple political reason that workers aren't going to put up with it anymore, and they won't have to, is my argument. You mentioned productivity and uh, and how poor productivity growth in Canada is. The former Minister of Finance here has recently uh, penned a book that says that's one of the biggest challenges. Why is productivity growth such a challenge in Canada? Well, that's a really good question, Brian. And I don't think anybody has a clear answer. I would say one element, though, of it is this fact that there is capital misallocation in Canada. In one sense, we have it easy, or we have had it easy historically. We're sitting on a ton of natural resources. Canada is an extraordinarily well-endowed country in terms of the value of its mineral wealth per capita. It is one of the richest countries on the planet. And so we've had it easy. We've been able to live off essentially the royalties of that which doesn't require necessarily productivity transformation. If you look at the most dynamic economies in the world in the 20th century, the Japans, the South Koreas, they tend to be poor in natural resources and therefore have only one resource they can really depend on. That's their labor and making their labor more productive. And we haven't had to do that in Canada. So we don't have that kind of culture. Um, rates of new business formation, you know, aren't, aren't perhaps the most inspiring. It's not bad, but, Fundamentally, as I say, when there are some easy wins, either buying resource assets or buying real estate, and those are your guarantees to get rich, um, why would you invest in trying to transform the productivity of your labor? If you're a business manager or you're someone sitting on a million dollars and you can you know, you can invest it in your company that produces widgets, whatever it is you produce, in order to increase its output. Or you could invest it in real estate. Even if you didn't have a million dollars to invest, I mean, if you had a million, you know, right now, it would make more sense to put it, if the, if the central bank is more or less going to throw money at it so that it goes up by 40% in value a year, why would you put it into anything else? But if you approach a bank for a loan, you'll be even more hard, more, press, more hard pressed. If you say, look, I've got this tremendous technology, this opportunity that will raise the output of my labor, which will be good for the firm, it'll be good for the profits, it'll be good for the economy. 
the bank, <clears throat> the regulatory structure doesn't reward it, doesn't incentivize it giving a loan like that. You have to have a lot more security to obtain a loan in those situations. Whereas with the house, because there's an asset they can put on paper and they can list that as being, you know, on their, on their books as, as balancing off the value of the loan, they're much more able and much more you know, freely going to give you that loan. So the whole banking system becomes heavily invested in this kind of model, which is unsustainable and which doesn't encourage the investment that is going to be truly transformative. I think on top of that, you can add that, you know, the question of scientific innovation that I would argue this is a, you know, this is a, a, a pet peeve of mine, but I think that Canadian universities, I believe, punch below their weight when it comes to scientific innovation compared to, you know, American and some Asian universities. Um, I think we should be doing better work. Um, that has to do with how universities are managed in Canada. But that's a topic for another day. Fascinating conversation we're having with uh, John Rapley tonight about uh, the economy in 2023. We're going to take a final break and come back with some concluding comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm having a really fun time tonight chatting with John Rapley. He is uh, a PhD. He's uh, uh, a political economist at the University of Cambridge. He is a managing director of C. Ford Macro. Uh, he's a frequent contributor on the Globe and Mail and other publications, uh, uh, academic and, and otherwise. Uh, and he's written a really interesting article just recently in the Globe and Mail that I found fascinating, uh, where he argued that 2000, 2023 is going to be a terrible year in the stock market for investors, but a great year for workers, which I found really quite interesting. Uh, John, we've talked about uh, productivity. We've talked about house prices. We've talked about liquidity. We've talked about inflation, interest rates, et cetera. If you were governor of the Bank of Canada, what would you do? Well, Brian, I would continue with the the tightening that's underway. I mean, I think the, the Bank of Canada should have started this a long time ago. They probably should have never engaged in the degree of easing they did. There were political reasons they did. I think they can be forgiven, but they got behind the curve and they're going to have to continue the tightening at a slower pace. But what I think they need to do is they need to continue signaling quite clearly. And I don't think they're necessarily doing a good job of this that this is a new regime. The idea that we're, you know, it's a transitory process, we'll soon get back to the way things were. Um, if they invest too much of their capital in that message early in the year, I think they're going to have egg on their faces yet again and going to have to backpedal. Uh, I think the bank, so I think definitely there's a long way to go before we really rectify the imbalances that emerged as a result of its monetary policy. Okay, so if they're going to continue that raising of interest rates and or keep it high for the full year rather than uh, what, you know, frankly, you're right. A lot of business people think it's going to come down in the spring or summertime. Um, if you were the Minister of Finance, given that situation, what would you do? So if I, if I were the Minister of Finance, Brian, uh, the first thing I would do, well, and this is the politically you know, nightmarish scenario, but I think it, if you look at what the Biden administration is doing in the United States, it's actually pretty good. So you provide, you do the exact opposite of what the Obama administration did in the wake of the 2008 um, you know, crash, which was a fairly modest fiscal stimulus and a massive, uh, alongside a massive monetary stimulus. That, of course, wasn't the government doing that. That was the Fed. But if there had been a very large fiscal stimulus at that time, the monetary stimulus would not have been necessary. The kind of imbalance that emerged, uh, that have emerged, I would say, you know, that have uh, at, at the tail end led to such craziness as the, you know, some of the some of the speculation in in Bitcoin and things like that that was happening last year, which is just crazy, or you know, the Robin Hood meme trading and that sort of thing. That wouldn't have happened, I think, had there been a more reasonable monetary policy. So in some sense, the Biden administration is correcting for the sins of the past. They've had a very large fiscal stimulus and also significant investment in infrastructure development, namely with the misnamed Inflation Reduction Act, which is creating new technology. I think that's what should be done in Canada. I think not necessarily at the moment, but if there are signs of recession, that's where should support should go. It shouldn't be going into trying to give uh, tax relief for mortgagers. It shouldn't go, not that way. You know, you give money directly to people as consumers. And if they want to use that to manage their higher interest rates, fine. But I think the key thing is not to focus on preserving asset values, but preserve consumption at the lower end. And I think boost investment, particularly the kind of investment that's going to lead to the transformative technologies in, for example, renewable energy, as is being done in the United States, because there's a lot of entrepreneurship there, a lot of possibility 
uh, lots of new firms. And that's where we might finally see some kind of productivity revolution happening. John Rapley, thank you so much. Really appreciate your, uh, your words today. Thank you. Pleasure. Have a good evening. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for joining us. I remind you I'm on every night, uh, Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online, even from the UK at www.saga960am.ca. Good night, everybody.